Um, so our, our final presentation today um, it is on donation of the circulatory death, um, which has made an impact on the widening gap between the demand for and the supply of donor organs. For our final presentation, Dr. Tony D'Alessandro will discuss DCD success at UW and nationally, as well as trends for its future use. Dr. D'Alessandro is a professor of surgery at the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health. He is surgical director of multi-organ transplantation at UW Health and is the medical director of UW Organ and Tissue Donation. Dr. D'Alessandro's clinical interests include liver, kidney, small bowel, and multi-organ transplantation. His research interests include marketing and social networking efforts to increase awareness and the rate of organ and tissue donation, as well as the implementation of donation after cardiac death policies. Please welcome Dr. Tony D'Alessandro. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I would like to say that they saved the best for last, but that's clearly not the case. The, the best was the second to the last. Um, it's really hard to follow a presentation like Meredith and Walter's presentation. And um, all of this boring doctor talk is uh, exactly that boring. Um, but it's, it's necessary for us to be able to show you the impact of, of donation and transplantation. And I could stand up here and give this talk a hundred times, but you all will get a whole lot more by listening to people like this who have been donor families and recipients. So, but even with that backdrop, I'll give my boring talk. <laughs> um, so uh, DCD uh, and an effective OPO and transplant relationship, um, it's clear that you need a relationship between your OPO and the transplant center, and we've been very unique in that we are a uh, single center OPO and a single center trans uh, single transplant center. And so, in the early years, uh, we have always been together and have always collaborated, and have always been aggressive in recovering and transplanting organs so that we can provide the opportunity and the gift of life uh, to as many people as possible. Um, just by historical um, um, back, background, DCD used to be called non-heartbeating donation, and um, for the first 35 years or so of transplantation, that was the only type of donation. There was no uh, brain death, there were no brain dead donors, and in the early years there was only kidney donation. And um, the types of um, uh, donation that we uh, do are primarily patients who have a significant neurologic injury uh, who are um, uh, really in their last illness and want um, to have their support withdrawn. And in that setting, in that end-of-life setting, and, and we view DCD donation as a part of end-of-life care for patients uh, who are not brain dead uh, and who would like to donate, and we uh, provide them with that opportunity. Now, in the United States, uh, the type of DCD donation we do uh, is category three. Um, there have been some pilot projects to do uncontrolled uh, DCD donation, which are the first two categories, and those are um, more popular and have been done in uh, countries like Spain, where you do not need consent to um, uh, put a cannula in cool down a patient and then find next of kin to do consent. In the United States, that has not gone over that well in terms of um, we tend to be more uh, autonomous in what we want to have happen, whereas other countries believe that there is a greater um, societal uh, obligation. Uh, there are some patients who uh, are brain dead, but uh, some families cannot accept um, the fact that we would recover organs before the heart stops, so we have on occasion uh, had to do that, or a patient becomes unstable and has a cardiac arrest. Now, um, I did mention that most of the candidates are patients with neurologic injuries um, who um, will not survive off-life support and um, want uh, their families, and they have made a, an advanced directive where the families have decided they wouldn't want to live that way, so they want to withdraw support. However, we also have um, 
done patients that are non-neurologically injured. Um, uh, quite a number of patients with ALS um, who do not have a neurologic injury, who have um, decided they no longer want to live on a ventilator at home and have decided um, that they would like to withdraw support. And in many of those instances, we have actually obtained consent for donation from the family before a withdrawal of support. Um, so there are other categories other than neurologically injured uh, patients that, um, that are candidates for uh, DCD donation. Um, so we try to determine, and I'll show you a, a slide of a tool that we use to, to not everyone is a candidate. Um, there's um, medical eligibility that's required. And so we, the OTD um, receives a call about any patient who has got a low Gla Glasgow coma scale or any patient who's in a situation where they're uh, having a discussion about withdrawal of life-sustaining uh, therapy. And so we make a determination of medical suitability. And we also do a respiratory drive assessment to see if that patient um, um, may continue to breathe after withdrawal of support. And so um, most of the patients that um, uh, expire after withdrawal of support occur within one hour of extubation. Um, and most of those deaths occur within 30 minutes of extubation. And so some of the subsequent slides I'll show uh, talk a lot about how DCD is different and the takeaway message about DCD is that it requires a lot more effort, a lot more communication. There are many more well-defined roles and responsibilities that, that the staff have at the OTD, the transplant center, and our donor hospitals. And, it's, um, and there are a lot of the guidelines that are related to DCD that we at the UW have been at the forefront um, since the early um, days of uh, transplantation, and mostly because UW actually never stopped doing non-heart beating donation. Um, when brain death came into uh, to being, uh, many transplant centers uh, no longer would do non-heart beating donation. And so it wasn't uh, until the cyclosporin introduction, better immunosuppression, and the extra renal organs like a heart, lung, liver, um, that, that people decided um, to move um, uh, toward brain death, and then the opportunity for DCD became more apparent when the, the lists in the U.S. began increasing, and people thought we should go back to the way we used to do it to offer the opportunity to more patients. UW never stopped doing that, and it was kind of unique. I know when I was in my training, I thought everybody did DCD, or non-heart beating donation. It turns out that nearly nobody did. Uh, and we pretty much had to lead the, the, the effort nationally as well as internationally to the point where um, we were instrumental in um, uh, doing education for some groups in Canada, were part of their symposium, and now they have a high percentage of DCD donation, as well as in the UK, where now 50% of their organ donation are from a donation after circulatory death. So this is um, a tool that uh, one of our transplant coordinators, um, um, uh, with uh, the help of one of our qualitative scientists, came up with um, a tool for respiratory drive assessment. And it's still used by a lot of places. And um, it basically will predict um, quite good 80% uh, uh, of the patients who will expire if they w withdraw support. There's about 20 to 25 percent of the patients that, that uh, we will attempt DCD, uh, and um, they don't expire in time. And I'll discuss a little bit about that has to be prepared for, we have to be ready for that. And, um, and we actually at the OTD have um, those, those families are followed as well. They're called donors in spirit, where um, where we follow them up just as though they were donor families who actually donated um, because they went through the entire process except didn't donate organs. But we're about 80% accurate uh, when we decide uh, to go. Now, th the opposite is we looked at some of our data, and when we say, no, we think they're going to survive longer than the two-hour period, 20% um, of those will expire in less than two hours. And so 
we actually miss some donation opportunities, but we, we have to decide, you know, from a resource management standpoint, from the number of cases that were referred, how can we manage all of those? And so when we have a, um, a patient that has a low score and a family is, is motivated to donate uh, and they want us to try and they know what the statistics are, we will go. Um, we never view uh, a donation that does not occur as a failure. We view it as making that we've made every effort to uh, honor their um, uh, request to be a donor or their family's request. And we also have the opportunity, because these are not very frequent events, the opportunity for training of hospital staff in real time about how this process works, because it is more complicated uh, than uh, brain death donation where basically patients declared brain dead and you have the surgical teams arrive who then can recover all the, we do all the surgery on the patient and then we recover all the organs. So uh, it's fairly straightforward in that setting. And this was what I had uh, uh, alluded to. We had looked at some of our data about what happens when we say no, how many of those patients might uh, progress. Now, um, once a patient, um, is declared, they have to have, well, they have to have five minutes of no cardiocirculatory function. So a patient will have PEA, and at that point, there's a five-minute period before the physician can declare the patient dead. Now, um, that was part of an, an Institute of Medicine recommendation, and I had been on two of those um, consensus conferences, and Early on, there wasn't a lot of data um, to support how long you should wait. Um, there are a number of OPOs now that have moved to two minutes, and the reason two minutes um, is important is that there has not been any cases of what we call auto-resuscitation, where the pulse may come back after two minutes, and then you have to wait till that pulse disappears again. And so some OPOs have moved to two minutes. We've stuck with five minutes, but there is, there is, there is data out there now that says you really only need to wait two minutes. Um, and obviously the death has to be declared by a physician not associated with the transplant team. Um, and that's pretty wide known, widely known now, but earlier in, 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 in these, the years, um, some physicians and hospital staff would ask us, why can't you, you know, do the declaration? Why can't you administer medications? And it was clear that they didn't understand the process and the conflict of interest that is involved in that. And I'll go over some of the slides regarding what we do in the operating room, but in the operating room, only uh, one of the OTD coordinators is permitted in the OR. Um, the team can, cannot be in the OR. And um, only when the patient is declared dead does the surgical team go in the operating room to recover uh, the organs. Now, what are the goals of um, DCD donation? And I think it's important, and I mentioned it earlier, that uh, donation is um, under the umbrella of end-of-life care. And this, this is an opportunity for patients and families uh, uh, where all efforts have been made to save the patient, but obviously they can't be. And so there's an opportunity to offer them um, donation in this setting and, and to leave a legacy of their loved one behind. And so that is a priority in this process. Um, and both death with dignity and, and being an organ donor are, uh, are clearly possible in these settings. Now, um, these are important factors to patients and families, and they're the same factors that are important in any end-of-life setting, and so not just in the DCD setting, and so we're very cognizant and aware of what patients and families um, uh, like and need. So um, a little bit about the organ recovery process. As I mentioned, there's a lot of communication and a lot of uh, logistics that need to be sorted out. Um, First question is, where will the patient's uh, support be withdrawn? The vast majority are in the operating room um, because in the operating room, we have the possibility of doing extra renal organs, uh, liver, pancreas, uh, and lungs. Um, if you're in the ICU, depending on how far away the operating room is, potentially you could do extra renal. Um, but when a patient expires, then you have to find your way to the operating room 
and that's a whole nother logistic uh, exercise where the elevators need to be set up. You need to know what floor you're going to. You need to know where the operating room is, and sometimes they're not right next to each other. So, um, but if a family, you know, understands how this all works, and um, they want to stay in the ICU, we obviously honor that wish, and most of the times that will be uh, kidney-only uh, donors. Um, in the operating room, we do most of the donations uh, in the OR. So one of the things that we do um, is that before support is withdrawn and with consent, so there are procedures we can do, there are medications we can give with consent of the family, uh, and there are, um, say, for example, bronchoscopies that we can do if we're considering uh, lung donation from a DCD donor, which we do, as long as we have consent from uh, the family. And so what we do before the family comes into the OR is uh, we will isolate the femoral artery and the vein, and uh, once that's ready, the patient's prepared, uh, the team leaves the OR, and then the family uh, and the withdrawing physician uh, come into the operating room. This, uh, the pre-cannulation, as we, go, we don't actually cannulate, but to have those vessels ready reduces the warm ischemic time to the organs uh, because we can put the cannulas in once the patient's declared and start flushing the organs. Lots of roles and responsibilities. We have uh, organ procurement coordinators who um, we, who normally don't go on the recoveries. Um, we have a separate recovery team, but in this setting, we, we require that an organ procurement coordinator uh, go on the recovery um, because there is a lot of, um, there are, we're all about huddles in the OPO, so you have to have huddles for everything. You have to get all the right people together, and it's like herding cats sometimes, and so, um, the organ procurement coordinator has certain roles and responsibilities that you see here. The surgical recovery coordinator who uh, is responsible for the OR has certain roles and responsibilities. And the surgeons and uh, our assistants as well. Um, one of the things that we do that is very unique that I don't know that there's any other OPO in the country that does it is that when the surgeon and our fellows um, arrive on site, um, we meet the family um, and we talk with the family. And in our experience, the family is quite grateful that the team meets and speaks with them, answers their questions. We get to know uh, who their loved one was, uh, get information. And actually, uh, I think two or three, probably three years ago now, our OTD instituted a moment of silence in the operating room for all donors where they will um, um, have a family write something about their loved one or um, uh, one of the staff will gather information and then talk about who this person was um, and their gift that uh, they're giving in this setting, whether it's brain dead or uh, DCD donation. But we think that is a valuable training opportunity for surgeons um, rather than going to a, a uh, lounge somewhere sitting and waiting to be called into the operating room to recover organs. So uh, we want a, a real face and name to these patients who are graciously giving uh, at the time of death. Um, there's a hos the hospital team, um, so we have many hospitals in our service area, so it's not just at UW. We have a huge service area. Uh, and last I remember, I'm trying to think of how many square miles, 55,000 square miles, I think, and, and 104 hospitals that we are responsible for. And we depend on many of the staff at those hospitals, the ICU nurses, the respiratory therapists, the pastoral care. Um, all of these people are involved in the, in the DCD process. Um, we do need an ICU nurse to be able to give the medications uh, uh, before withdrawal of support, and the physician. We obviously have to identify a physician, and as you probably know, many physicians are busy working in ICUs, and we need them to be able to come to the OR or be in the OR the whole time if possible during the withdrawal process. And so the, o the OTD has to set all this up ahead of time. Um, some more, I talked about the declaring doc. Um, now, a lot of the cases are coroner cases. We have to deal with coroners and MEs. 
And so there are a lot of roles that people have in this process. As I mentioned, huddles uh, uh, all the time, making sure all the documentation is complete. There is a lot of paperwork involved in any donation, but in DCD it's even more. What we need to do if we're considering lung donation, we need to identify uh, someone who will reintubate the patient once they're declared dead because during a lung recovery, uh, the thoracic surgeons would like the lungs inflated during preservation. So um, while we're recovering the abdominal organs, either um, a nurse anesthetist or an ICU doc or someone will reintubate the patient, inflate uh, the lungs, and then once the uh, trachea is stapled, the lungs will be inflated and um, preserved in an inflated state. So we need to identify that person ahead of time. We need to know if there's a pancreas part of the procurement, whether or not um, we're going to give some other medications that help uh, clear out some of the bacteria and fungus in the, um, in the duodenum. So there's a lot to consider. Um, we talked about uh, all the chart review uh, medications. Um, those are all, like I mentioned, that's part of the donation. Pro anything that's part of the donation process does not need an extra consent. So like the Uniform Anatomic Gift Act, uh, the consent form. Um, but when you're doing other medications that are not for the patient, but for the uh, purpose of uh, preserving the organs for donation, we need consent. So the cannulation, the regitine, the heparin, mucinist, um, uh, any other medications that we give uh, prior to withdrawal support, we obtain consent uh, from the family for that. Um, these are all the things that are discussed. Everything I've been discussing, we discuss ahead of time to make sure that in this what, um, what we call high acuity, low frequency event, um, that everyone is on the same page, know what they're supposed to do, know the medications they're supposed to give, know what their roles are, know where they're supposed to be, all the instruments that we need. Uh, the entire process is, is choreographed ahead of time uh, so that there's no mistake or no issues that occur. And, and I think that's a, a great, uh, you know, we have to commend the people who are involved, especially the OTD, in arranging all of this with our donor hospitals and all the staff that are involved. Uh, we talked about respiratory therapy. We need a portable vent. You can't transport with a normal vent. So we need to have portable ventilators. Um, the chaplain will be with the family or, or, or some other uh, hospitals have bereavement care specialists that work with the families and escort them out of the OR uh, once uh, the patient's heart uh, stops. I talked about introductions to the family and the training uh, uh, for our surgeons and, and fellows um, and uh, for the OTD staff and what to expect. And we answer any questions. And it's, it's really uh, eye-opening sometimes uh, to listen to what families uh, ask and to respond to them and, um, and follow up with them in the future. Now, I'm not going to go uh, over all the different types of things in terms of the uh, withdrawal, but I just know that it's either in the ICU or in the operating room. And um, in the operating room, in some of our donor hospitals, um, we have all of, uh, we have DCD uh, carts, so to speak, where things such as tissue, uh, chairs, uh, anything that would be required for the family to like sit as comfortably as possible with their loved one in the operating room, knowing that the operating room is a sterile environment that's kind of cold. But we, you know, we ask what kind of music they like. Uh, you know, do they want us to play music for them? And if so, we usually don't get rap, but you know, uh, sometimes. <laughs> um, but whatever they want, we play in the operating room for them. Um, just all the equipment that we need. Uh, here's uh, some of the things that we make sure uh, that are in the operating room before uh, the family enters into the operating room. Uh, the patient's usually covered, but we pull down the OR sheets so that their head and their arm is accessible to the family. Um, sometimes they want to be there for extubation, sometimes they don't, um, and sometimes they want to be there the whole process until their heart stops. And they're 
obviously we allow them to come and go as they feel necessary. Um, and some stay the whole time, some are unable to do so. Now we talked about non-progression that happens about 20, 25% of the time. So we need to be prepared uh, with a unit. Um, uh, usually it's the same unit, but not always. Sometimes they'll go to a palliative care unit. Um, if they don't progress in the time uh, that's compatible with donation, they'll go to another unit. And we, we need to make sure that um, there's a caring team that will accept, for that, accept that patient when they go back. Um, and the vast, most of these patients expire usually within a few hours. There are some patients that may live a day or two after withdrawal as well, but um, no one survives to leave the hospital. Um, since I'm a surgeon, I have to show a surgical picture. Um, all the organs are, as opposed to the brain dead donation where we dissect separately the organs, in the DCD donation, the, the organs are recovered on block. Uh, mostly because we're doing a liver and a pancreas and kidneys. Now, if for some reason um, there's not a pancreas uh, as part of the uh, donation, we may dissect the liver separately and the kidneys separately. Um, but if there's a pancreas involved, we'll take them out on block. I don't, I don't show the thoracics here. Sorry, Lucian. <laughs> but um, the thoracics are obviously considered in every young healthy DCD donor, uh, and we probably do one or two DCD lung transplants per year. Um, and um, it's, it's uh, very gratifying to see that those lungs work very well. Now, just a few statistics. Um, DCD donation has grown. Um, when when um, we started uh, in, the mid, uh, in the 1990s and 2000s, about 8% of UW's donors were DCDs. Uh, in the mid, early to mid-2000s, uh, at that time, Secretary Tommy Thompson was um, head of HHS, and he um, was a governor here in Wisconsin who uh, instituted this National Organ Donation and Transplantation Collaborative and set a lot of goals for increasing donation. And uh, one of those goals was to have 10% DCD donors. We were almost there, and we thought that you know, it should be higher. Currently, it's about 14% in the U.S., and UW has between 20 and 30% of our uh, donors are DCD donors. Uh, and this kind of just goes over some of that, what I just said, but also shows that when we looked at a recent cohort of DCDs uh, or attempted DCDs, our statistics are still holding. About 22% of the patients that we attempt do not expire in time um, to be able uh, to donate. Um, and this just kind of shows the UWOTD trend in terms of donation, uh, in terms of uh, total donors, uh, in terms of brain dead uh, donors, and uh, DCD donors. Um, last year we had a, a little decrease in our overall donation, uh, but this year we're way back up again. So it's kind of the nature of uh, donation. Um, I'm just going to go over a little bit. Back, we, we wanted to kind of show what our nearly 30-year experience was with uh, DCD donation uh, and what our outcomes were because, you know, the, the, the organs have a little more warm ischemia. They may not work as well. Um, and you want to make sure that your patient and sur uh, graft survivals are as good uh, as the brain-dead donors. So we looked at a 29-year experience, which was published in the Annals of Surgery um, uh, from 1980 until 2008. And this just kind of shows the numbers of additional transplants uh, during that period of time. So there was uh, over 1,200 more transplants done because we were able to offer DCD donation uh, to families and patients at the end of their lives. Uh, and we looked at the results compared to nearly 6,000 uh, brain dead donors. So it's a large, large cohort. And um, we kind of broke it up into eras, um, uh, um, two roughly equal eras to see, you know, overall how were the outcomes as we got better um, in our preservation, we got better in our techniques you know, were there improvements in the outcomes? And you'll see that that, that was the case. 
and is the case for both kidney uh, and uh, liver transplantation. Standard uh, procedure, as we've been discussing, how we recover organs from a DCD donor. Um, and the warm ischemic time. So once you extubate a patient, um, what was the average time um, before you were able to flush with cold perfusion solution? And you can see there most of those times are um, less than uh, 30 minutes or at 30 minutes. And actually, it's kind of increased in the second year as we've become more comfortable uh, with some of these processes. And um, many, many of the things that we look at after transplantation in terms of complications, there was no differences. However, delayed graft function was higher um, uh, in the DCD transplant. But interestingly, um, Usually delayed graft function is a marker for uh, uh, worse graft survival long term. And that does not end up being the case in DCD donation. Why that is, people have speculated that the mechanism of dying is different. Uh, in a brain dead donor, you have a huge cytokine storm or release. You have a lot of factors that, that are affecting the organs at the time of, of brain death as opposed to a non braid dent situation. So DGF did not uh, really cause any issues long-term in DCD kidney transplantation, but it clearly was uh, clearly higher. And in ERA-2, you can see that it's even higher. And when we looked at that, as ERA-2 had older patients, we be, uh, uh, the donor population is aging, so we had older patients more patients with diabetes, more patients with hypertension, so kind of the definition of what used to be called an expanded criteria donor kidney ECD, which, or now which is a kidney with a, a KDPI of greater than 85%. Now, when we looked at the entire cohort, there was a difference in patient and graft survival. Uh, but um, when we uh, separated that out, um, in two eras, in the second era from 1993 to 2008, there was no difference in patient or graft survival. A lot of things improved. The pre-transplant the pre evaluation of patients uh, it clearly improved. Post-transplant care has always is improving. Immunosuppression is improving. And our DCD techniques have, have improved as well. So it's pretty clear that you can offer uh, DCD uh, transplants, kidney transplants for a large number of patients and have equivalent patient and graft outcomes. Is the DGF rate a little bit higher? Yes, um, but um, those patients nowadays compared to the earlier days when, of transplantation are discharged from the hospital and go to what we have. We have actually a delayed graft clinic uh, where they spend a few days and then go home after that. Um, but they're transplanted, they're off the list, and the, it's clear that the data shows transplantation is far better than remaining and less expensive than staying on dialysis. Now, we looked at liver transplants at all, as well, and we were one of the first centers to do liver transplants uh, from DCD donors, and um, our protocols uh, went into effect in 1993, I believe it was, because um, we were only doing DCD kidneys, and because the outcomes were the same, um, we there was no difference. Um, there was um, we decided we didn't need a special protocol for kidneys. Uh, but when we started doing extra renal, we felt we needed to have specific protocols that defined a lot of what I showed earlier, and so those were specifically put in place in 1993. Um, but we, this cohort looked at 87 DCD uh, liver transplants, and you saw the warm ischemic time. And um, there was no difference in the primary non-function, uh, uh, no difference in hepatic artery uh, or portal vein complications. They did require more blood product utilization intraoperatively and did have a significantly higher um, biliary complication rate which has been the Achilles heel, heel of transplantation. When you go back to brain dead donation, that was the Achilles heel in the early days, and it became the Achilles heel with DCD donation. And um, so our goals were 
fixated on how do we make that better and how do we in, improve that. And I'll show you some of the reasons or some of the ways we did that. Um, there was a, a little bit increased uh, rate of retransplantation uh, in uh, liver transplantation as well. Um, there was also a, a decreased patient survival and um, graft survival when you looked at DCD. Now, the patients that were transplanted um, did well, that survived and had good outcomes and didn't die while they were waiting on the list, but clearly um, it, this was not the outcomes that we were you know, looking for in terms of equivalency to brain dead donation. So you know, we made changes um, and we looked at uh, a, a more recent uh, cohort of patients from 1994 to 2014. And if you look from uh, what were some of the things that we were trying to change, we were trying to decrease the warm ischemic time if possible. Uh, we were trying to, uh, the donor age really didn't change. In fact, donor age is now going up. Um, the, you can see the MELD score at the time of transplantation has gone up. And the cold time, uh, from the time we take the organ out to the time we got it in, did decrease. And it's clear that cold time and warm time are very important in terms of present, preventing some of the ischemic changes to the bile ducts. Um, when we look at um, graft survival, uh, cholangiopathy, and infection rate, no difference in infection rate, but if you look at the, um, the period, uh, I gotta look up, I can't point at this screen, <laughs> it doesn't go up there. Anyway, if you look at ischemic cholangiopathy uh, in this most recent era, it's down to 9.1%, uh, which is pretty much equivalent to uh, our brain dead uh, donation uh, setting. And so some of the things that we did um, uh, are here. Uh, as a result, we did expand the age up to 60 years. We now perform pre-recovery um, biopsies uh, on the livers. We used to bring the livers back, biopsy, and then you would have more cold time accrue on the liver. Now we know that the liver for sure is good with a biopsy before we recover it. And we will start the operation on the recipient with that information as soon as um, the patient expires within an acceptable period of time. Now our donor team and the OPC or the or procurement coordinator or the surgical recovery coordinator is in the operating room and they're looking at vitals, uh, blood pressure, pulse rate, uh, looking at O2 saturations, and we're getting uh, texted this information because we're trying to make a decision, is this going to be a suitable organ for transplantation? Um, and so um, uh, that information is relayed to us and we make that decision in real time. Um, we exclude livers that have macrosteatosis of more than 20%. In a brain dead setting, we'll use up to 40%. And we're limiting the warm ischemic time we did, we've changed the way we define the warm time. The systolic blood pressure is set less than 70 or O2 sat. We used to, from the time of extubation until um, 30 minutes, and then we would not proceed with liver transplantation in that setting. And it didn't matter what the O2 sats or blood pressure was. Now we are looking at that period of time when the saturations or the blood pressures fall below 70. And so um, just this past week, we went out to 55 minutes, but there was only 15 minutes where the saturations were below um, 70. And so, and that liver is working just fine. So we're becoming a little more sophisticated in how we look at the warm ischemic time. Uh, I mentioned that we bring the patient to the OR. Um, uh, once we know everything looks good on the donor side, we start the recipient surgery. Our average time is, is probably five and a half hours at this point. There's some data that shows three days of induction with thymoglobulin uh, reduces ischemic cholangiopathy. Uh, we're not sure of the mechanism, but the data is there, so we are doing that as well. We use uh, TPA, two milligrams, in the hepatic artery. Um, we actually reperfuse off the hepatic artery most of the time uh, first because the bile duct is um, 
supplied by the hepatic artery, and the sooner we can reperfuse that, the better. A couple of my partners still don't like to do that, so they're, they're saying that they are the control arm of this, but we'll see how that works out. Um, we also, there's some evidence that doing a port cable shunt uh, decompresses the, the splanchnic or the uh, small bowel circulation such that there's not any toxins that build up that are reperfused in the liver that cause reperfusion syndrome and may uh, contribute to biliary complications. Uh, we usually put a T-tube in the DCD donors, but our most recent experience has gotten so much better that we have in selected cases stopped using uh, a T-tube uh, on these patients. Um, you can see the percentage of DCD donors that we've done since 11. Uh, in 14, 15 and a half percent of our livers were DCD. Um, in 2015, 9.2 percent, and I think we've already done five or six DCD livers this year so far. Um, we had one retransplant due to a hepatic artery problem, and only 11 of the transplants were perfused through the portal vein. It's not a big number. We're going to look at those to see if perfusing off the hepatic artery versus portal vein makes a difference. So if we go to an even more recent era, um, 213 to 215, you can see that our donor age has been going up. Our recipient age has stayed about the same, but it is older as well. Uh, but because of new allocation schemes, uh, the SHARE 35, the MELD score of our patients um, is now, in these patients, 27.7. Our average MELD score actually now at transplant is 31. You, we can discuss offline the merits of SHARE 35, but um, it's clearly driven patients to, to be sicker, stay in hospitals longer, have greater lengths of stay, and things like that. So. Um, and the cold ischemic time is now down to 5.6 hours. Um, and then we look at um, uh, uh, the graft survival um, is quite excellent. Um, there's no, no bioleak difference, ischemic cholangiopathy. 2009-2014 um, was a little lower. It's a little higher between 2013 and 2015, but we have not retransplanted anyone uh, in this period of time uh, for ischemic cholangiopathy related to a DCD liver. So DCD liver transplantation is really um, uh, coming along, and I think um, it really is a way to offer patients um, liver transplantation, particularly in this day and age where everyone is waiting on the list, is a lot sicker, their melds are getting higher before they get offered a transplant, or they die on the waiting list. And um, usually what we tell patients is if their meld score is over 18 or 20, that they, we can send patients for DCD livers because there is a little, there previously was a difference in outcome. And we tell them that the benefit uh, of accepting one of these livers far outweighs any disadvantages of ischemic cholangiopathy once their MELD is over 18 or 20. Now, um, we do pancreas transplants. I stopped doing them a few years ago. I like them, but I just couldn't do them all. Um, and in, there is really no difference in outcomes. That's the takeaway message. Uh, most people uh, don't do pancreas transplants in the U.S. actually. Um, the Midwest seems to be the region for pancreas transplantation, whether it's Minnesota, Wisconsin, uh, Indiana, Ohio, um, seems to be the highest utilization of pancreases in the U.S. Um, but the bottom line was, despite the pancreas having all this enzymatic activity, we really found no difference in any of the complication rates, uh, nothing in the thrombosis rate, the use of hypoglycemic agents in these patients, um, no, no statistical difference in any of those complications. And if you look at the patient survival out to 10 years um, and, the, and the graft survival out to 10 years, it's actually numerically a little bit better than the brain donation, not statistically different, but you can see uh, that it's equivalent to um, brain-dead pancreas transplantation. Now, I'm not a lung transplant surgeon, Dr. Lucian, but a lung transplantation uh, has done very well with DCD donation. You can see in this experience there were 21 cases. Um, 
and the patient and graft survival at one and three years showed no difference whatsoever. So uh, anytime we have a young, healthy, uh, potential DCD donor that um, uh, is a suitable donor organ for one of our recipients, we will, the OTD will evaluate it for uh, transplantation. So in conclusion, um, DCD donation uh, has now become a, a greater percentage of most uh, transplant programs, um, transplants uh, that they do. The protocols and guidelines uh, are fairly standard throughout the country. There are minor variations, but most places uh, uh, consider uh, doing them in a very similar way. Um, the outcomes uh, for kidney and pancreas are equivalent, and same thing with lung transplantation. Liver took a little longer to come along, but with recent modifications and changes that we've instituted. Um, I don't want to go out on a limb and say they are equivalent, but at this point in time, it looks to be that they're equivalent to brain dead donation with the modifications uh, that we made. So in summary, the opportunity for families to donate, for recipients to benefit, uh, is greatly enhanced by programs uh, being able to offer um, uh, DCD donation um, for their donors and for their recipients. Thank you. Thank you. That was an excellent presentation. Um, do we have any questions or comments? Thank you. Tony, thank you for a very uh, uh, nice uh, review and exciting uh, on this, this exciting topic of DCD transplantation. We are very, watching very closely to the results from Australia on DCD heart transplantation and as well as here with the help of transmedics, the heart in the box. Um, I think this is, uh, will help uh, reduce the, the need for donors and that would be great. I was, one, um, I was wondering whether it actually seems like it's impressive how UW and, you know, you have uh, a great experience with DCD. I was wondering if we were able to create like a national group to kind of work on this protocol. Sounds like you optimized it even, you know, just considering mm -hmm. the ischemic time and, you know, the, the wait time, 30 minutes from hypotension, not from extubation mm -hmm. and withdrawal of care. Um, just to standardize and improve this, I think it's nice to, if you share that with others. Yeah, um, well, we were um, heavily involved in the first two Institute of Medicine uh, consensus conferences, and there was one uh, in the U.S. not that long ago led by Frank Delmonico uh, out of Boston, and we were heavily involved in those uh, as well. We've worked with AST, American Society of Transplant Surgeons, as well as UNOS, um, and many of, many of the guidelines that you see are uh, direct involvement of UW uh, in those uh, implementation of those protocols to try to standardize this across, uh, across the country. It's interesting you mentioned the lung in a box. Um, if, for people who don't know what the lung in a box is, this is a resuscitative effort of a lung. The heart uh, in the box. Uh, uh, what, uh, heart in the box as well. And the lung in the box as well too, right? Um, where you send a, a heart and a lung off, uh, it gets resuscitated, sent back and transplanted. Um, the, we are also now, uh, probably starting in the fall, part of a normal thermic liver perfusion uh, uh, study, a clinical trial in the US, where the function of the livers, at least in the preliminary data out of the UK and uh, in Canada, shows that the livers work better in warm, so you warmly perfuse the livers after you procure them, and any damage uh, seems to get better uh, in the warm. And so that will be a way to potentially expand even the liver transplantation such that you might go further out on your warm ischemic times um, to uh, offer donation or offer livers to patients who you would not otherwise use because you're afraid they wouldn't work right now. Other questions? 
Are there any other questions? Uh, Thank you very uh, much. Are we going to the bar after this? <laughs> <laughs> I would like to, on behalf of Optum Health Education, we'd like to thank uh, UW Health and their faculty for um, a very successful conference. And we'd also like to uh, thank all of you for your participation um, to uh, attend some more of our educational programs. We hope to see you soon. And uh, if you're traveling, we uh, wish you all safe travels and uh, have a nice weekend. <laughs>